Episode number 356. Good news, bad news. The emergency room was bustling with doctors and nurses when Bradley and the nurses arrived. Bradley didn't know what to do. The love of his life was lying on the stretcher. She meant more to him than she could ever imagine. As the doctor checked Elizabeth and tested her, Bradley sat beside his wife, holding her hands until the doctor finished. Sir, I'm sorry, but you will need to move. If you don't, it'll be hard for me to check your wife and test her for any illness. If you insist on staying there and being in my way, the doctor said, seeming quite irritated. Bradley had no choice but to get up and let the doctor do his job. He did move, but he stood nearby, scowling at the doctor as he performed his tests. A couple of minutes later, the doctor told the nurse to wheel Elizabeth into another room for more tests. Make sure you get enough blood samples for testing, he told the nurse. Yes, doctor, said the nurse as they wheeled Elizabeth out of the emergency room. Once the nurse took Elizabeth away, the doctor explained to Bradley that his wife would be okay and that he didn't need to worry. He didn't suspect that she had food poisoning. He thought she might be pregnant. He had asked the nurse to do a pregnancy test on Elizabeth once she was awake and do some other tests as well. When Bradley heard the news, he didn't know how to react. On one hand, his wife might be pregnant, but on the other hand, his grandmother was on her deathbed. Bradley decided it was best to see his grandmother while waiting for Elizabeth. Her time was running out by the mere second. He told one of his bodyguards to stay close to Elizabeth and call him when she woke up. He also told them to let him know right away once she's done so he could come back. When he arrived at the ICU room and saw how weak and fragile his grandma looked, it broke his heart. She had all kinds of machines hooked up to her and looked haggard and much older than she did last time. The doctor noticed him standing by the glass pane, watching his grandma, and came over to speak to him. Excuse me, by chance are you her grandson? The doctor asked, hopefully. Bradley nodded. I'm Bradley Jones, you are right. I'm indeed her grandson, he admitted. I'm Dr. Evergreen, nice to meet you, he said as he offered Bradley a handshake. How is she doing? He asked next, ignoring the doctor's handshake. As you know, her last surgery, she didn't do too well. This heart attack only made her condition worse. Based on our calculations, she doesn't have much time left. Give or take a few months. Maybe a year at max if she's lucky. Bradley's knees felt weak from what the doctor had just told him. At any moment, he could have fallen to the ground right after he heard the doctor. Are you sure? Is there nothing we can do, doctor? If there's any other way, we, we have the money and I'm willing to pay whatever. The doctor cut him off by shaking his head. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but no matter how much money you have, it won't help her, he said. The only advice I can give you as of now would be to make her last days on Earth the happiest. And another thing I'd like to know is if you would like to inform her of this, or if you want to do it yourself, he asked curiously. Bradley had to think about it. He knew that a discussion with Elizabeth and her family was in order. Out of everyone he knew they'd be able to give him the advice and guidance he needed. Since I can't speak with her right now, if she wakes up, could you inform her that I came by to visit and that my wife and I will be waiting for her in the visiting room until she wants to see us, he said as he turned around, returning to the emergency room to check on his wife. When Bradley arrived at the emergency room, Elizabeth was back already. She was awake and was waiting for him. The doctor had informed her that she'd get the lab results in an hour or so, so all she had to do was wait. She saw Bradley walking toward her, and her smile widened. 
Honey, you're here. I'm so sorry if I scared you before. The doctor thinks that we might be pregnant. The results aren't out yet, but I do hope it's true. I hope we're pregnant. This way the children can grow up without a huge gap in their ages. Won't it be so great? We'd have our own cute litter. She broke off as Bradley hugged her tight, not saying a single word. He trembled as he and Elizabeth embraced, making her worry for him. She caressed his back, trying her best to calm him down. Love, what's going on? Is it Grandma Becky? How is she? Did you see her already? Elizabeth asked. She tried pulling away, but Bradley wouldn't let her go. It was then Elizabeth realized Bradley was actually crying. She made him sit on the hospital bed, trying to calm him down and talking to him as gently as she could. She let him cry for a while. Afterward, she finally got up and faced him. Brad, remember that I'm here for you. You can tell me anything. I want to share your burden with you. Don't keep it all to yourself. Elizabeth said as she lifted his chin and wiped his tears. On cue, the doctor came back with the test results. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, congratulations, you're pregnant. It's been about three weeks, so I suggest you be careful since you're in your first trimester. The doctor happily informed the couple. Elizabeth laughed joyfully. Bradley, on the other hand, was stunned and unable to utter a single word. When he finally regained his senses, he lifted Elizabeth and twirled her in the air. We're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby, he exclaimed. Let's go and see Grandma Becky. Hopefully she's awake already so we can tell her the good news, Elizabeth said. Once they entered the elevator, Bradley told Elizabeth about Grandma Becky's current condition, specifically the part about how long she had left. Elizabeth, upon hearing the terrible news, burst into tears, sobbing uncontrollably. She loved Grandma Becky so much. And to think she didn't have much time left in the world was unfair. Nevertheless, the first thing they wanted to do when they visited her was to announce that they were pregnant, the second being that they'd get married for the second time. After that, They'd all move back to New York and live there as they needed to make sure that Grandma Becky was happy for the rest of her days. When they arrived at the ICU, Grandma Becky was awake and the doctor let the couple enter to speak with her. He made them wear hospital gowns, caps, masks, and gloves as a preventative way to make sure that they were sanitized before they spoke to her. Once they did all that, they were ushered to Grandma Becky's bedside. The older woman had a smile on her face to show her happiness to still be alive and kicking. If only she knew that she only has less than a year to live, would she still be able to smile as she's doing now? Elizabeth whispered to Bradley as they approached the older woman. Episode number 357, Biggest Mistake As they approached the older woman, they could only be by her side and hold her hands with gloves. Bradley stood on one side and Elizabeth stood on the other. They held each of her hands, trying their best not to shed any tears in front of her. Grandma, how are you feeling? asked Elizabeth whose eyes widened when she realized her mistake. What a stupid question from me. I'm sorry, Grandma. I know you're in pain. Grandma Becky was trying her best to seem fine, even though the pain was excruciating. Don't fret, kiddo. I'm fine. The machines are only necessary to keep track of my vitals. That's all, she said calmly to her granddaughter-in-law. Bradley, on the other hand, just stood there watching as his grandma and his wife conversed. His wife tried her best to be optimistic while telling Grandma Becky about their time in Madrid. 
So you were telling me that Mr. Cedric found his true love and decided to stay there to be with his special someone? Well, I'm so happy for him. When I get discharged from this hospital, let's commission him to do a winter collection for the whole family. I want to see his talent with my own eyes, Grandma Becky concluded. Grandma Becky was doing her best to be cheerful in front of her grandson, who still hadn't said a word. She lightly squeezed his hand, hoping to get another reaction than the expression he had on his usually handsome face. When Elizabeth finally finished telling everything she had to tell her, the room went eerily quiet, as they had nothing else but one last topic to discuss. Elizabeth, being the one who silently volunteered to, had no choice but to bring up the subject of Allison's death. Grandma, she started, not knowing how to talk about it. Is it all right for us to speak about her? Elizabeth asked, refusing to mention Allison's name. Yes, dear, I'm fine, as I told you. When I first heard about it, I was in shock, but I can handle it now. I have come to terms with her death ever since she had once faked it. It means nothing to me now. I only wish that I let her speak with me one last time, Grandma Becky said calmly, much to Elizabeth's surprise. It was a shock that she didn't even shed a tear at the death of her daughter. It was as if it never occurred at all. After hearing what Grandma Becky said, Elizabeth chose not to speak about those who had already passed. Instead, choosing to inform the older woman of the good news they had in store for her. Hopefully, hearing it would make her have the need to want to live longer. I changed my mind. Grandma, how about we tell you some good news instead? She suggested as she smiled happily. Grandma Becky's eyes widened. Oh, you have good news to share. Do tell, she said as ideas started forming in her head. She thought that they'd announce that they were getting married, but when she found out that wasn't the case, it was likely she'd probably have another heart attack. Elizabeth looked at Bradley with pleading eyes. She wanted her husband to be the bearer of good news, even though he didn't seem to be in the hospital room, but far, far away. He didn't notice Elizabeth trying to get his attention. That was until she called him. Brad! Brad, honey! Elizabeth spoke, raising her voice to grab his attention. Bradley was in somewhat of a trance when he heard Elizabeth's voice. I'm sorry, sorry, what was it you were saying? He asked in confusion, wondering what Elizabeth wanted to tell his grandmother. His eyes immediately lit up when he remembered the good news he wanted to share with her. He faced his grandma, a huge grin on his face, as he announced as his eyes shine brightly. Grandma, you better get well soon since you'll need all the energy you can get to help us with the children. It's fine with just twins since Liz's parents can help us, but when this new baby comes, who knows, we might have another set of twins. Hearing the good news Bradley had just told her, tears began to gather in her eyes as she tried to resist the urge to cry from happiness. You're pregnant? Becky was laughing. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank you for letting me live long enough to see my great-grandchildren grow, she said silently as she squeezed both of her grandchildren's hands. While Elizabeth and Bradley were at the hospital, Sean had to fly to New York to handle what would happen with Allison's remains. He decided to have her corpse cremated so he could let his grandmother decide what she wanted to do with her daughter's ashes. Fully knowing that she'd ask for her ashes to be scattered into the vast ocean to set her free. Bradley and Elizabeth stayed at the hospital to take care of the older woman, while the rest of the family didn't know the good news that they had in store for them. The couple decided to keep it a secret till the older woman recovered and could join their festivities. Days went by and the older woman was finally discharged. She looked like her usual self and was full of life. She insisted on staying with Sean to strengthen their bond, and Bradley didn't stop her. 
Since Bradley was still undergoing treatment, they decided to remain in London for time being. They agreed to let Sean go to New York and run the corporation under the guise of being Bradley. It was a risky decision for Bradley to let his brother disguise himself as him. But there was nothing he could do at the moment. His life was still in danger, and there was still a chance that he could not be cured. And if that happened, he needed Sean to be ready to take over until his sons were old enough. Unknown to them, this was the biggest mistake Bradley had ever made. The power to be in control of a vast corporation was very tempting, and it would be the demon that Sean would face when the time came. Episode number 358, Taking Over Everything was well planned out. Bradley was to spend some time with Sean so he'd be informed of the things he needed to know as the CEO of THJ Group. And Butler John would also return to New York to accompany and assist Sean. Bradley spoke with Ryan to inform him of his plans about guiding Sean and assisting him in running the company. Ryan was ecstatic when he heard that Sean was returning to New York and Bradley wasn't. Ryan had plans of his own, and the fact that Bradley was now out of the picture helped it greatly. As a precaution to make sure no one would suspect him, Sean would live in Bradley's mansion and act as if he was Bradley himself. This plan would continue until Bradley was finally finished with his treatment. So, for now, Sean was Bradley. Since Bradley had been absent for about a year, there was a board meeting to address the issue. The plan was to use the reason Bradley had gotten in an accident while he was on a business trip and lost his memories during the accident. It was foolproof, since it was a valid reason for why he had gone absent for so long. And it also wouldn't be suspicious if Sean ever made mistakes that Bradley otherwise would never have. In no time, Sean was in New York, ready to take over the company in place of his twin. He was taken to Bradley's mansion, where the household help didn't know that the man who'd be living there wasn't Bradley. They were disappointed to not see Elizabeth with him when he arrived. Before he arrived in New York, Sean had learned all of Bradley's mannerisms to act less suspicious and trick others into thinking he was Bradley. Since the bodyguards they had hired were still new, they didn't know how Bradley regularly acted, so it wouldn't be too hard to put up an act. Sean would only stay at the mansion for one night. Then, using the excuse that he missed his wife and couldn't stay in their home without her, he would eventually leave to stay at the condo. Only Butler John would accompany him there. The next day, Sean arrived at the THJ Group headquarters, where the board of directors was lined up at its front, waiting to welcome him back. All the higher-ups had received a memo that CEO Jones was finally returning after a long absence. Ryan was briefed about this and knew that it was not Bradley, but instead, Sean, his twin brother. He was to act accordingly, making sure he was present when Sean arrived. Welcome back, CEO Jones, everyone greeted as he made his way to the inside of the building. Sean acted the way Bradley normally would, wearing a cold, stern-looking poker face as his bodyguards followed right behind him. Ryan walked by his side as he headed straight to the building's private elevator not acknowledging the presence of any board members or the other higher-ups. As much as Sean had previously practiced, his heart was thumping like crazy. Everyone gazed at the CEO of THJ Group. Their gazes never left him as they waited for the elevator to arrive. Minutes later, a ding was heard and the elevator doors opened. Everyone waited for Bradley to enter Ryan waited for him, planning to use the common elevator. But Sean was having none of it, 
Once the doors were about to close, Sean spoke. President Davidson, what are you waiting for? Come, I have something to discuss with you, he said sternly, showing others his voice of authority. Ryan raised his brow, uncertain if this was some joke and whether or not he should enter the elevator with him. He didn't want the others to get suspicious of Sean for doing things differently than Bradley would have done. Still, he did let everyone hear that they had an important matter that needed discussing. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to enter the elevator. Right before the doors came to a close, Ryan entered the elevator. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Sean said, much to everyone's surprise. He had shocked all the board members and all other higher-ups that were currently present. That was Sean's first mistake. Bradley would never say that. Is he all right? I've never heard him say this before. Is that because of his accident? Did it somehow make him more human than he was? Asked one of the board members. Hmm, it's a good thing then, answered the other board member. You are correct. This might greatly benefit the company admitted another board member. While they were busy gossiping, Sean continued speaking, continuing to thank everyone for all their help and how they kept the company going when he was absent. As I was saying, now that I'm back, we will take the THJ group to the highest level. Together, we will work to be the best of the best. He spoke with sincerity, eyes looking at everyone in the room for approval. Once he finished speaking, everyone clapped at his words, right before they continued their busy business agenda. About half an hour later, the meeting was finally over, and all board members were satisfied with the progress they made, and extremely glad CEO Jones was finally back. They felt much better knowing that their stock prices would increase instead of staying stagnant, which was the case when Bradley was out of the picture. Sean made a promise that he'd take the company to another level. He had many projects in mind, and with Ryan's assistance, they'd take THJ Group much higher than it was already, and hopefully show his grandmother and his twin brother what he could accomplish. Ryan, on the other hand, had different plans. Now that Bradley was out of the picture, Sean was only a puppet, Ryan was going to execute the plans he had been scheming for the longest time. It was time to take the game to the next level, and that was to venture out of THJ Group and formulate his own company. Episode number 359, Trouble. The days came and went, and Sean was busy learning the ropes. Only now did he realize how hard it was to be in his brother's shoes. From the very morning to late at night, he was busy, and he was so busy that he had no time to even breathe. He was massaging the back of his neck while he leaned on the chair. He closed his eyes and tried his best to relax when someone disrupted his few seconds of rest by knocking on the door. Come in, Sean called out loud enough for the person on the other side to hear him. He heard the door open, and a voice said, If you hadn't had dinner yet, why not have dinner with me? We could go to the restaurant owned by Alden Sanchez's family. What do you think? Someone asked him. Sean opened his eyes and stretched his arms seeing Ryan in front of him. I'm exhausted. I don't know how Bradley did all this without going crazy. He mumbled while getting up, preparing to leave. He turned off his computer, picked up all the documents on the table, and stacked them up neatly on the side of the desk. Once he was organized and perfectly placed, he grabbed his cell phone before reaching for his jacket. Let's go, I'm famished. At this rate, I could eat a whole cow he said jokingly, while walking towards Ryan. Once he reached Ryan, he placed his arms on Ryan's shoulder before ushering him out the door. They arrived at their destination in no time, and when the restaurant's hostess saw two good-looking men, a sweet smile popped up on her lips. Welcome, CEO Jones. 
President Davidson. This way, please. She greeted and then guided the two to the private room reserved for THJ Group. Once the two were seated, a waiter came with a pitcher of water and poured a generous amount into each glass. Good evening, CEO Jones. President Davidson, would you like the usual family specials? The waiter asked, still holding the pitcher. Sean looked at Ryan, wondering what the family special was. Yes, of course, and bring us a bottle of red. We could use something to relax right now, Ryan said, before turning his attention to Sean. So, how is it so far? Are you getting the hang of everything? I know it's difficult at the beginning, but this was how I felt when he disappeared for over a year and left me to take care of everything. But don't worry, you'll get used to it after a while. Soon enough, it'll be nothing to you, he assured his cousin. But Sean was deep in his thoughts. CEO Jones, is everything all right? Penny for your thoughts? Ryan asked the staring Sean. Sean regained his senses, snapping out of his short trance. He slowly raised the wine glass, taking a small sip. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Sean asked guiltily, now giving Ryan his full, undivided attention. I was asking if everything was all right. You seem preoccupied with something. If there's anything I can help you with, I really wouldn't mind, he said as he also took a sip from his wine glass. He played with the wine glass. Sean sighed. I was thinking about Troship navigation and what I should do with the company. As you already know, it's my mother's legacy. I mean, I have to take it over, right? I'm her son. I just don't know what Bradley plans to do with it now that my mother is no more to force his hand. Before coming to New York to play the role of CEO, Sean had initially planned to take over Troship Navigation and do it justice, as it was the least he could do for his actually deceased mother, who did raise him, even if she hadn't been a good mother to him. Well, at the moment, I wouldn't worry about it so much. Bradley let them continue their operations as if it were never acquired. Once he's finished with his treatment, he could probably ask him to give it to you. I'm sure he trusts you with the way you'll run it. Ryan assured, ready to continue giving Sean advice until a waiter came with their much-awaited dinner. One by one, waiters laid plates and plates of food on the table. Sean's eyes widened when he saw how many dishes were there when only two people were eating it after all. Wow, those are a lot of dishes. There's only the two of us and I'm not much of a big eater. So there's no way we're going to be able to finish it all he said while picking up a fork. Ryan only smiled at Sean's comment. Sean didn't wait for an invitation. Though he missed the taste of all the home-cooked meals that they had back in London, Mrs. Moore was one hell of a talented cook, and it was as clear as day that she poured her entire heart and soul into whatever she cooked. Sean could feel it while eating whatever she had made, and he missed her cooking. The two continued eating in silence, thoroughly enjoying their dinner. They decided to go to a nightclub to relax, since it was the weekend. But what Sean didn't know would be that it would be the same place where he'd run into Emily Clark, and trouble would begin. Episode number 360, Emily Clark is back. The club was packed and it was still quite early. When Ryan and Sean arrived, the doorman immediately recognized them and quickly opened the door to enter. Sean's two bodyguards tailed them, following them from behind, being inconspicuous. They were ushered into a private room for VIP guests. While Bradley never paid attention to his surroundings and would just walk straight to the VIP room, Sean casually strolled, gazing at his surroundings. While checking out the people at the facility, Ryan walked ahead of them. Meanwhile, Sean acted as if he was some child in a playground. Since this place was new to him, he paid attention to the many beautiful women around him before he caught sight of a girl dancing. 
He didn't realize he had stopped walking and that he was watching her dance before Ryan tapped him on his shoulder. Sean, come on. I thought I lost you. Did something catch your eye? He asked. Right before his gaze landed at the exact same spot where Sean was looking, his eyes widened when he realized who he was looking at. It was Emily Clark dancing seductively. She made all the men around her drool, and with that, Sean was simply no exception. Ryan shook his head once he saw the look on Sean's face. Knowing that the man next to him was done for, Emily was a leech and she'd do anything in her power to latch on to the most powerful men in the country. Unfortunately, Sean fell under that category as the CEO of THJ Group. He needed to break the spell she had cast on him, or the both of them would be in trouble if Emily spotted them. Sean didn't know about her previous history with Bradley, and falling for her wouldn't sit well with Elizabeth. With that in mind, he wouldn't possibly let it happen, especially not in this lifetime. Come on, there's plenty of fish in the ocean. With your good looks and money, finding the perfect girl would be effortless. Ryan reasoned, trying to do and say something to pull Sean's gaze away from Emily. Finally, Sean moved, following Ryan to the VIP room, before looking one last time in Emily's direction. Once they were inside the VIP room, Sean wanted to ask Ryan if he knew who that beautiful woman was, but he decided against it as he didn't want it to be too evident he was smitten. They sat there talking, drinking every once in a while, as Sean would occasionally look at the dance floor from where he was seated just to see Emily and a couple of her friends dance. After several sessions, she finally left, making Sean get up to see where she was headed. Emily was having a blast. It had been a while since she had so much fun dancing. She knew that everyone's eyes were on her and she loved every minute of it. She loved the attention other men gave her and the looks jealous women threw at her. She had recently returned from abroad and had been upset when she found out that Kevin Davidson was no longer the president of THJ Entertainment and that he had also gotten married. She was planning to make a comeback in the entertainment business and for that, she needed him. He was essential for it, but he was no longer there. After dancing for a long period of time, a small layer of shine that was sweat covered her skin, and she needed to go to the ladies' room to freshen up. On the way there, she accidentally glanced at the VIP room, where she could see a silhouette of those inside the room. Her eyes widened when she caught sight of Sean, who she thought was Bradley. This was an opportunity she knew she couldn't possibly let go of, so she decided to take it. She quickly went to the ladies' room, freshening herself up and making herself as beautiful as she could. The last time they met, Bradley didn't want anything to do with her, but that was over a year ago. She was humiliated beyond repair, and her parents were in rage even ready to order someone to take revenge for her. She was blacklisted in the entertainment business, leaving her to go in seclusion for a year. However, things had just changed over the years, and her family business was in trouble. The only way they'd be saved was if she married with money to help save their company. So that's what she had been doing ever since she had arrived hunting for her prey using her allure and luring charms. And she knew that her luck was about to change if she could get close to Bradley. After carefully examining herself in the mirror, she stepped out of the ladies' room, making her way towards the VIP room with a smirk on her beautiful face. However, as she was right about to enter the room, she was stopped by two bodyguards at the door when she was minutes from entering. I'm sorry, but this is a private room. You can't enter, said one of the bodyguards. 
Emily scowled after hearing what the man said. She couldn't believe that this person didn't know who she was. She was a celebrity, and everyone in New York knew who she was. How could he have not known? That itself was a mystery. Excuse me, do you know who I am? I'm a family friend. You could go and tell him that it's Miss Clark if you're unsure. She ordered the man who was looking her up and down, checking her out. He was right about to say something before the door opened, and Sean and Ryan came from right behind him. What's going on? Sean asked curiously. His question seemed to be somewhat answered when he saw Emily standing right in front of his two bodyguards, but he instead looked at Ryan, questioning what was happening. Ryan wasn't sure how to respond to Sean. He needed to do something, as he wasn't enlightened in regards to Emily and her lies. But just as he was about to pull Sean back inside to have a word with him, Brad, oh darling, it's been a while. I thought it was you, oh Brad, Emily said before charging towards Sean at full speed, embracing him ever so tightly before kissing him on the lips. Ryan was speechless. It all happened so fast that his mind was completely boggled. What do I do? I need to brief him about this snake of a woman. She's so toxic, he muttered, bewildered. When the bodyguards noticed what happened, they backed down. They stepped aside, turning their attention to the dance floor, pretending they didn't see anything. Ryan was still stunned by what Emily did, but he also knew there was nothing he could do but watch and see how Sean would react. Many things were clouding his mind, making him unsure of what to do next. Sean was stunned by the sudden kiss on his lips, causing him to back away while trying to push Emily as far away from him as possible. Emily instead clung to him, encircling both her arms around his neck. Lady, please restrain yourself. I'm a married man, he exclaimed after freeing himself from Emily's clinging grasp. Emily acted surprised before she pouted, trying her best to look upset. So, you still haven't gotten rid of that woman? Hmm. She's not even your real wife. She's just the surrogate mother of your child. You already got what she wants, so why are you still keeping her? She asked. Sean quickly placed his hand on her mouth before dragging her to the VIP room. What are you talking about? Where did you hear that she's only with me as the surrogate mother of my heir? Sean asked, distraught after hearing the bombshell Emily had dropped. When he had first found out about it from Ryan, Sean had chosen not to believe it. He thought that Ryan was just defaming their relationship out of spite. But now this strange woman was saying the same thing. He couldn't help but wonder if that was the truth. Ryan quickly intervened, pulling Sean away from Emily and to one of the room's corners so she wouldn't be able to eavesdrop on their conversation. Sean, calm down. I'll explain everything to you, but we need to get rid of her first. She's bad news, so just stay here. I'll do the talking for you, okay? Before turning his attention to Emily, he said who took it upon herself to sit down and pour herself a drink. Ryan walked towards the sofa right where Emily was sitting, before sitting across her. Once he was seated, he crossed his legs before leaning on the back of the couch, his face showing a look of displeasure as his brows were furrowed. He let out a sigh before he finally spoke. Emily, you know what you had done back in London. Why are you doing it again? Do you really have no shame? I don't know what you're expecting to accomplish with what you just said, but let me warn you first. I will not let you get in between the two. Do you understand me? He said, with a dead serious look in his eyes. Sean remained still, standing at the far corner of the room. He didn't want to move and sit close to her, knowing she'd cling to him once more. So he kept his distance. Emily took a generous sip of her drink before she replied. Hmm, why? I only said the truth. Both you and I know their marriage was arranged. 
and that they only got married so she could be deported back to Canada before she bore him children. Now that she's already given birth, she should just leave and return where she belongs, which is away from my man. She already fulfilled whatever was in the contract, so she should go, she said, before taking another sip and glancing at Sean, who was listening closely. At those very words, Ryan was speechless. His eyes widened in shock, and he realized Emily knew absolutely everything written in the contract. He needed to know how she got a hold of the information in the first place. Also, knowing he needed to do something to shut her up, especially if she decided to let the media know about Bradley and Elizabeth's contract, it would damage THJ Group in the process. Emily, let me ask you this. What is it that you're after? You don't expect that Bradley would even consider taking you back after what you did in the past. You cheated on him and left him for another man. And when that man threw you away, you hooked up with my younger brother. As if that wasn't enough, you planned to blackmail Bradley by making it look like I slept with his wife. Why the hell would anyone in their right mind want anything to do with you? Ryan shouted angrily. He was more than ready to drag her out of the VIP room at any time. Sean heard every word Ryan had said, causing him to look at the beautiful woman wondering how anyone would have thought someone like her was filled with so much venom. From the corner of her eye, Emily noticed how Sean was looking at her, loving every moment of it. From the way he was salivating at her mere glance, she knew that it was her perfect chance to get him back, so she uncrossed her legs, making sure he had a glimpse of her thigh as she lifted her legs. Ryan saw what she did and was disgusted by her, unlike the mesmerized Sean who didn't realize what she was doing. He knew what her intentions were, so when Sean slowly made his way towards the sofa and was about to sit down, Ryan quickly got up and pulled him away from the VIP room. We need to get out of here now. She's a venomous snake who cheated on you and left you for another man. Let's go, he said loud enough for Emily to hear before giving Emily one last death glare. Ryan and Sean disappeared from the doorway, leaving Emily stunned and unable to utter a word. Sean let Ryan drag him out of the club, only asking Ryan why he did such a thing once they had entered the car. What is the relationship of that woman with Bradley? Is she an ex-girlfriend who dumped him before? And what's the story that made you so upset? You clearly had something against her while you were talking to her. You were pretty harsh, he said, as he asked Ryan what was lingering in his mind. Ryan was contemplating, wondering if he should tell Sean everything, so he knows that Emily is bad news. He should absolutely never get together with her, no matter what happens. But eventually... He decided to wait a while to tell Sean about it at a time when he was calm and collected. We should talk about this some other time. As long as you don't let her near you, you'll be fine. In the meantime, I suggest that you don't return to the mansion or the condo. You should stay at my place so she doesn't find out when she comes looking, Ryan suggested, while he massaged the back of his neck where a headache was brewing. Sean didn't argue, even though he didn't get the answers to all his questions. He'd wait to talk about it, but he needed to know what was going on, too. He didn't want to jeopardize the relationship between his brother and sister-in-law. They were his family, and he'd protect them at all costs. Episode number 361, Christening of the Twins. Meanwhile, back in London, it was a few days before the twins would be three months old and Elizabeth and Bradley decided to have them christened. A Christmas party was going to be held for their office. It was agreed if they'd have the christening and Christmas party on the same day. They decided to have the party at one of the clubs in their subdivision. 
William and Alice already met many homeowners in their subdivisions and wanted to show them their hospitality. Bradley and Elizabeth agreed and they met up with the president of the homeowners associations and informed them of their true intentions. The subdivision association's president was ecstatic to say the least after learning that the Joneses were throwing a party for the whole community together with their employees. Usually the association's head would be the one in charge of throwing parties, but their volunteering took a considerable heap of her burden away. Each year they would raise money to help with the hefty cost, but for this year, since Anne and Bradley had offered, they were more than glad to accept it all. A large part of the community RSVP'd informing the rest that they'd be joining, which caused Elizabeth to be in a frenzy, wanting to make sure everything would be perfect for the party. Stella was in charge of clubhouse arrangements, while Elena and Elizabeth were busy shopping for presents and gifts to give children of their employees and the rest of the neighborhood. On the other hand, Bradley, Logan, and Nathan tagged along to carry whatever they bought. And by the time they had finished shopping, Bradley was exhausted. This was the first time he had shopped like there was no tomorrow, and he never wanted to do it again. It was their first Christmas with the twins, so Elizabeth and Bradley wanted to make it a special one for their kids to be able to watch when they grow up. Bradley invited his best friend, Justin, to come, as he wanted him to be one of the twins' godfather. Elizabeth had done the same thing, inviting Anne to be the godmother of one of her children as well. Since Anne was traveling, she could not attend, although she had agreed to use a proxy and be the godmother of one of Elizabeth's children. Elizabeth had also invited Mrs. Garcia to be the godmother of one of her children as well, while Cedric would be her partner as godfather. Bradley let his wife decide, although when Elizabeth informed him that she wanted Cedric to be the godfather, he was extremely close to saying no. However, Elizabeth opposed him, and he knew he couldn't possibly win. Think about it. With Cedric, the boys would have godparents. Don't you think so? She reasoned argumentatively just so that Bradley would approve of it, which he did after he heard her constant bantering, only being able to accept the fact and let it go. The days came and went. There was just a day left before the event. Everything was set. Stella had hired one of the best catering companies. They'd work with another catering company to have a variety of dishes to choose from. A surprise was waiting for the Moore family since they had absolutely no idea that Bradley had arranged for his best friend, CEO Justin Rogers, to come along and bring Thomas Moore, Elizabeth's older brother, with him. It was to be a surprise Christmas present for his in-laws. He had also arranged for Liam's return. No one from the Moore family knew the surprise that was on its way. What do you think? How do I look? Alice asked, directing the question to her husband. William turned around to get a good look at his wife. He squinted his eyes. Hmm, let me see. Why don't you come closer? My eyes aren't too good anymore, he said. His eyes squinted as he tried to see. Alice walked towards him, a shy smile on her old face. Well, what do you think? I need to make sure that we don't embarrass our in-laws. So, I have to look my best, said Alice as William looked at her, wanting to make sure she looked presentable and as beautiful as always. You're fine. You look amazing. What about me? He asked, fixing his shirt's collar. Alice looked at him over and circled him. After coming to a full stop right in front of him, she nodded before giving him a thumbs up. Looks good to me. The two looped hands as they walked towards the main house, wanting to check on everyone else's progress. Elizabeth and Bradley were in the living room playing with the twins, accompanied by Grandma Becky and Hannah when the two arrived. Grandma Becky was sitting beside Elizabeth while Hannah was standing beside the sofa watching. Everyone looked up when they heard the door open 
seeing a couple dressed to the nines when they did. Elizabeth was beaming with pride. Words couldn't describe how proud she was of her parents. Dad, Mom, you look amazing, picture perfect, she praised. Bradley pitched in, praising his in-laws. Yes, Mom, Dad, you look perfectly dressed for the occasion, Bradley pitched in. Thank you. We wanted to make sure that we're dressed properly for the occasion, William answered, speaking for the both of them. Bradley stood up, holding one of the twins. Should we head to the church? We've only got an hour before the mass starts. He then held out his free hand, helping his wife get up. Elizabeth accepted Bradley's hand getting up. Hannah went to help Becky, and just like that, everyone was ready to leave for church. The church was filled to the brim when they arrived. Elizabeth's eyes widened with what she saw. She couldn't believe how many people were there to attend their son's christening. It was unbelievable, and she had to cover her mouth before she let out a gasp of surprise. The reason for this all was mainly because of the president of the homeowners association. When he found out that the couple was planning to hold the christening during the day of the Christmas party, he took it upon himself to invite all the residents that he previously RSVP'd. His thinking was identical to that of the Moors. The more, the merrier. He didn't make a mistake, that being clear since the whole church shined with wealthy homeowners, decked to the nines with the finest of jewelry and clothing. Hannah helped Grandma Becky to the right side of the front aisle, reserved specifically for their family. Simultaneously, the left side was reserved for all the godparents of the twins. William and Alice followed with Bradley and Elizabeth right behind them, carrying each one of the twins. Sarah and June were right behind them, ready to take care of the twins if their parents got tired. Once everyone was seated, Bradley asked Sarah to take over and hold the baby so that he could make a call. Sweetheart, I'll be right back. I need to make a call quickly, all right? He said, before giving her a quick peck on the cheek before going to a free spot to call Justin. Hey, are you guys close? We're about to start, said Bradley. Well, hello to you too, Brad. Just hold your horses. We're outside the church. We'll be there in a few. Justin said before he quickly hung up, descending the vehicle. It was a joyful occasion for the Moore family. They couldn't believe that Bradley had asked Justin to bring Thomas along from Canada. And if that wasn't enough, Liam and Jacob were relieved from their duties so they could be with them on such a joyous occasion like this. A moment later, Mrs. Garcia arrived, Cedric in tow. Elizabeth was elated to introduce Mrs. Garcia to everyone else while Cedric chatted with Elena and Stella, telling them what he had been doing over in Madrid. Once they finished a session of hugging and crying, it was time for the christening to start. The respective godparents lined up right before the christening finally began. Episode number 362, The Matchmakers. After the baptism, everyone was invited to the venue where a feast was waiting for them to enjoy. They had an all-you-can-eat buffet-style feast where everyone could choose what they wanted to eat. The added addition of an open bar for those who wanted to drink themselves, possibly into oblivion, and all kinds of wines were available there. The saying, sky's the limit, was the perfect way to describe the party the Joneses had planned. The guests could be seen thoroughly enjoying themselves. They never wanted it to end and weren't too keen on returning home. Time flew by and it was nighttime. Mrs. Garcia was exhausted from the long trip, that being why Alice decided to invite her to rest at their house. It was an offer she couldn't refuse because she wanted to ingratiate herself with Elizabeth's mother and get to know her better. A few moments later, Alice left with Mrs. Garcia. Grandma Becky, Hannah, Tiny, Sarah, June, and the twins were also on their way home with them. Elizabeth and Bradley decided not to stay long either. Deciding to leave with Justin, who had already said his goodbyes since he was exhausted after the party, Elizabeth went up to her brothers. 
Thomas, Liam, and Jacob, Logan, and Nathan will take care of you. But we'll take our leave since Bradley needs to do something. Bradley was chatting to Justin to pass the time, waiting for her at the exit. Thomas had planned to go with them, but his brother stopped him before he could. Where do you think you're going? We're partying all night tonight, brother. It's been so long since we've been together like this, Nathan said to his four brothers. The brothers partied the night away. The couple accompanied Justin to his car before they left to return home. Since their house wasn't too far away from the clubhouse, they walked, followed by their two bodyguards. They hadn't gotten too far when Elizabeth's phone rang. She looked at who the caller was, surprised that it was Anne. She quickly answered her phone, wondering what Anne had to say. Elizabeth, I'm so sorry. How I wished I was able to attend the party. Anne apologized as her sadness was evident on the other line. It's nothing, Anne. Don't you worry. I wished you were here since I would have liked to introduce you to someone. I just thought you'd look amazing together as a couple. Elizabeth said jokingly, her lips curved up into a beautiful smile. Really? Now when did you become a matchmaker? Is the guy handsome? Anne asked jokingly. Since the call was on speaker, Bradley had heard what Anne had said since he was eavesdropping. He joined their conversation abruptly. Anne, if you mean more handsome than me, then I'd have to say no, though he'd be a close second. Bradley chuckled, the remark being halfway between a joke and a brag. Still in a playful mood, Bradley winked at his wife before stealing a quick kiss. Elizabeth pouted. What are you bragging about? You're just arrogant, she said snarkily. Bradley hugged his wife, pulling her closer. What do you mean, arrogant? I'm just telling the truth, aren't I, Anne? He asked Anne, who was listening to the couple's playful banter. Anne laughed softly. No comment from me. Anyway, aside from that, I called you to let you know that we're on the way, and if it's okay with both of you, could I spend New Year with you? Anne asked shyly, holding her breath as she waited on an answer. Oh my god, that's amazing news. Of course you can. When will you be arriving? Elizabeth asked excitedly, already planning on introducing Anne to Justin. If Anne hopefully arrived before Justin left, the two would have a chance to meet. Anne answered, We'll be there by tomorrow, and we're staying at this hotel. She said, before she gave more elaborate details about where they'd be staying. Okay, let's make plans to have dinner together later. We can continue the party at our house, so it looks like it's a date then. Elizabeth said, her eyes wide with happiness as she knew that Justin was staying at the very same hotel. To her, it was fate. All right, it looks like we'll be seeing you tomorrow, Anne said excitedly before saying her goodbyes and hanging up. Once the call ended, Elizabeth turned to her husband. Brad, would you please speak and ask Justin to stay for one more day? I want the two of them to meet. I truly believe they're a perfect match for each other. Elizabeth pleaded, staring at her husband with those irresistible eyes that Bradley couldn't resist. And what's my prize if I do ask? Bradley asked curiously as he caressed his wife's cheeks. Elizabeth thought about it before she whispered her answer so the two bodyguards wouldn't be able to hear. I'll give you whatever you want, she said seductively as she kissed the underside of her husband's ear. Yet the two of them had no idea that the two people they were desperately trying to matchmake were already doomed by their own fates. Episode number 363, A Merry Christmas for All. Elizabeth and Bradley were holding hands as they walked home. It had been a long time since they were intimate publicly. They were so loving and sweet with each other that their bodyguards had a smile on their faces as they followed them home. Bradley whispered to his wife, I promise I'll do my best to keep him in town until she arrives so that they can meet. However, you owe me a big one this time. You better make sure you pay up. He kissed the bottom of her earlobe. Elizabeth loved it when he did that. It gave her goosebumps each time. She turned her head to look into his eyes, her finger touching the side of his cheek. Anything you want, 
I'm at your beck and call. Master, she said, and Bradley couldn't wait until they got home. He grabbed his wife's hand and began to walk as fast as he could. When the couple arrived home, the house was already quiet. It looked like everyone was already in bed. There was no light in the kitchen, and the whole living area was also dark. The only light was in the hallway. It was still on to guide them towards the elevator. Elizabeth was wondering if Mrs. Garcia stayed the night or if she went to a hotel. Unfortunately, it was too late for her to call and check. She decided to wait until the morning to find out. They quietly went up to their room, making sure they didn't disturb anyone. Once they entered the room, Bradley couldn't wait and lifted Elizabeth and carried her towards their bed. Tonight you're mine, he said as he laid her down on the bed before he hurriedly began undressing her. However, Elizabeth was quick to get up and ran towards the bathroom. He didn't even have a chance to stop her at all. Where are you going? He complained as he threw his clothes on the floor. I'll be right back. Hold your horses. I need to freshen up, Elizabeth said. A few minutes later, Bradley could hear the water running. He knew she was taking a shower. He then quickly went to the bathroom to join her. Elizabeth was startled when the shower door opened and Bradley walked in, naked. A grin plastered on his handsome face. Do you mind if I join you? He said as he pulled her closer to him and began kissing her. Not at all. Come on in. I could use a scrub and you're the right person for the job. She said in between their hot kisses. Their night was well spent. The Moore brothers, who came home all wasted the night before, were still in bed when Elizabeth and Bradley came down for breakfast the next morning. Alice and William had woken up early to check on the clubhouse to see if the place was clean. Even though they had hired cleaning people to do the job, the couple wanted to make sure that the president of the homeowners association would not have a reason to say anything against the family. They were satisfied when they saw the whole place spick and span. Grandma Becky, Elizabeth, and Bradley were seated at the dining table already having a conversation when Alice and William made it back to the house. The couple happily joined them. Merry Christmas, greeted Alice as she approached. A wide grin plastered on her face as she got closer. A series of greetings were exchanged at the table. Just as Bradley was greeting his in-laws back, the Moore brothers all walked in happily chatting. Another series of greetings erupted in the room and everyone sat down at the table. William said grace and everyone joined in. While they were all enjoying their breakfast, Sarah and June arrived with the twins to greet everyone. Elizabeth and Bradley quickly put down their utensils to let Sarah and June get their breakfast with the rest of the household help and bodyguards. After breakfast, it was time to open gifts. Tiny gathered all the household help and bodyguards to the living room, where the whole family was enjoying morning conversations. Once they arrived, Grandma Becky asked Hannah to begin handing the envelopes. The first to receive were Tiny, Sarah, and June, since they were the closest to the family. Elizabeth and Bradley had given everyone their 13th month bonus along with some small gifts. These were given to Alice and William as a token of their appreciation. Sarah and June couldn't wait to open their gifts. They knew that Elizabeth had personally purchased each one. And from the look of the box's size, they could already guess what was inside. However, she'd wait until she was in her room to open it. Tiny also had an inkling of what kind of gift he had received from the box's size. He too would wait until he was inside his room before opening it. He didn't want others to see how special he was to the Jones family. After thanking their bosses, the household help and the bodyguards bid them goodbye to return to their respective jobs with the biggest smiles on their face. They sure had a very Merry Christmas this year thanks to their kind-hearted bosses.
Episode number 364, Surprise Visitor. Once all the household help and the bodyguards had left, only the family was left to exchange gifts. It was an awkward moment for everyone since they knew it would be their last time exchanging gifts with Grandma Becky. There was an eerie silence for a moment. Elizabeth nudged Bradley and in turn he looked around unsure of what to do. Alice saw this and prompted her two sons, Nathan and Logan, to begin. They quickly followed their mother's command. Nathan and Logan quickly kneeled by the Christmas tree and started checking out names on the gift card to hand out. The first was handed to Grandma Becky by Nathan. Grandma, this one's for you. He gave her a box that came from Alice and William. It's from Mom and Dad. Logan found more gifts for Grandma Becky that were from Bradley and Elizabeth. He handed them over. Then it was time for the gift from him and Nathan. Grandma, this one's from me and my brother Nathan. Hope you like it. He shyly told the older woman. Unable to look her in the eye, even though he treats the older woman as his own grandmother, he's still intimidated by the older woman's aura. Grandma Becky, with a sweet smile on her face, Thank you, children. I'm sure I would love it, whatever it is that you and your brother got for me. She then accepted the two gift boxes that Logan was holding. Grandma Becky was overwhelmed and unsure what to say. Tears were fighting to fall from her eyes. She slowly wiped it before thanking everyone. After handing over all the gifts that belonged to the older woman, Logan continued sorting the gifts and handing them over to their respective receiver. Since Thomas, Liam, and Jacob were not supposed to celebrate with them, there were no gifts prepared for them from their parents and two brothers. To their surprise, when Bradley suddenly disappeared and when he came back followed by Tiny and a couple of bodyguards, everyone was surprised that they were carrying boxes after boxes. He ordered Tiny to begin handing them over to his three older brothers-in-law. These gifts are from all of us. We're happy that you can be with us on this joyous occasion. Merry Christmas, Bradley said, while his arms were wrapped around his wife's shoulder, hugging her from the back. Thank you, said the three in unison. Soon the floor below the Christmas tree was clean of gifts, and everyone received theirs. Elizabeth, who held one of the twins while Bradley was holding the other one, had many boxes of gifts besides them on the floor, where they were seated. Why don't we take a picture of the twins and their gifts? This way they can see it when they grow up, announced Elizabeth. She then got up and started cleaning up the couch filled with gifts for their babies. That's not a bad idea. Let's put them down on the couch and surround them with the gifts, said Bradley. He got up, ready to set up everything. Thomas, who was still hung over from the night before, suddenly woke up. He quickly pulled out his cell phone and started taking videos of his nephews to show it off to his colleagues at work. Liam and Jacob did the same thing, and they were so thrilled that they were behaving like children in a chocolate factory. Then there were Elizabeth and Bradley, the proud parents who couldn't take enough pictures of their twins. Grandma Becky, Alice, and William had tearful eyes as they watched their family enjoying the festivities. Suddenly, Grandma Becky's phone lit up, and when she looked to see who's calling, her eyes brightened. It was Sean. She hurriedly answered the call. Sean, how are you, my grandson? She greeted. I'm fine, Grandma. How about you? It seems that everyone's having fun, he said while yawning and stretching his aching arms. Grandma Becky could hear it in the background, a hint of pain shot through her heart as she missed her other grandson. She wished that he could return for the celebrations. A tear settled on her old but still elegant face. The older woman was about to say something when the sound of the doorbell was heard. Everyone stopped and froze for a moment and looked towards the door. A second later, Tiny showed up and rushed towards the door to open it. Everyone was waiting to find out who was behind the door. They stood still. Bradley looked at Elizabeth while Elizabeth only shook her head and raised her hand to say that she had no idea who it was. 
while everyone waited to see who was at the door. The twins decided that they had had enough and began crying. That got Elizabeth and Bradley's attention, and they each quickly picked up one of the twins. Oh, are you tired already? It's all right, Leah, we're finished. We have enough pictures to last us a lifetime, said Elizabeth while dancing around with her baby in her arms. Bradley, on the other hand, didn't know what to do with his son. Lucas just kept on crying as if someone was pinching him. Hearing the baby cry, Alice quickly went towards Bradley and opened her arms, asking him to hand her the baby. Let me check, he could be wet or something, Alice told Bradley while waiting for him to hand her the baby. Bradley didn't have a choice but to hand the baby to his mother-in-law. He was getting frustrated listening to the baby whine. Just as the baby was handed over to his grandmother, Grandma Becky exclaimed, Sean, how could it be? I was just on the phone with you. You were in New York, you sneaky little bastard, <laughs> shouted Grandma Becky, while waiting for Sean with open arms to come over to her. Merry Christmas, everyone, Sean greeted. Grandma, I never said I was in New York. I was yawning because I didn't get much sleep on the plane, and it was a very long flight, he said while walking towards his grandmother to give her a tight embrace. Everyone welcomed Sean while Thomas, Liam, and Jacob were stunned and staring back and forth at Bradley and Sean, unable to utter a word. After a moment of shock, Thomas finally spoke. So that's what it is. I was wondering about the twins and now I got my answer. He was mumbling to himself. Bradley introduced the three more brothers he had not yet met Sean. After the introductions, it was back to opening gifts. However, no one had any gifts for Sean. Episode number 365 a gift to remember. Elizabeth realized the situation and nudged her husband to get his attention. Bradley leaned towards his wife. What is it, honey? Elizabeth pulled him closer and whispered, We don't have a gift for Sean. What are we going to do? Bradley facepalmed himself while thinking about what to do. When he couldn't think of anything, he decided just to make the best of the situation. He spoke to get his brother's attention. Sean, sorry that we didn't have anything for you. We didn't know that you were coming. However, since we are twins, I don't mind sharing mine with you. This one's from my wife, so that she wouldn't mind. He then handed a box to Sean before turning his attention to Elizabeth. Right, honey? Elizabeth only nodded. It was a good thing that she didn't buy something too personal. It was a generic gift that could be given to any man cufflinks. No, 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 it's all right. I understand. It was me who should apologize. I didn't realize that you guys celebrate in the traditional way of exchanging gifts. I wasn't able to bring Christmas presents for everyone. Actually, wait a minute. He then rushed outside, and a moment later, when he came back, he was carrying paper bags after paper bags. I got this from the duty-free at the airport as I was leaving New York. I hope you all like it. He then began handing it over to everyone. Alice and William were hesitant to accept the gifts at first, but with Sean's wide grin plastered on his face, visibly showing the happiness he feels, the couple couldn't deny him. Both smiled and thanked him graciously. For the Moore brothers, he gave them the brandy to share with each other. He then handed a small rectangular box to Grandma Becky. It looked like a piece of jewelry, more like a box used for a necklace. Grandma, I hope you like it. I know you have many things that are more valuable than this one, but this is from the bottom of my heart, he said with sincerity, and his eyes showed full of love for the older woman. The rest of the items he brought were given to Elizabeth and Bradley. There were some toys for the twins, exceptional chocolates, and mochi, among other things. Once he was done handing over the gifts, he finally accepted the gift Bradley had given to him. Even though it was a gift from his wife, he was willing to share it with him, and with that, Sean would accept it wholeheartedly. Grandma Becky called Hannah to come and help her to go to her room. 
A minute later, Hannah came running from the kitchen. She quickly went to the older woman's side and helped her get up from the sofa to her wheelchair. Excuse me for a moment, she said to no one in particular before leaving to go to her room. When she came back a moment later, she had a box on her lap and waved Sean to go over. Sean swiftly went towards the older woman and knelt on the floor so that he was face to face. Grandma Becky handed him the box. I was going to give it to you at a later date when we saw each other again. Now that you are here, it's as good a time as any, she said after handing him the box. Everyone was thrilled to know what Sean received from Grandma Becky. Meanwhile, Bradley was looking at the box that he had received from his grandmother. It was identical to the one Sean had received. He was now curious as to what it was that Grandma Becky had given them. Sean, go ahead and open it. Becky said. Sean hesitated for a moment, seeing that Bradley had to say something. Since it seems we received the same thing, why not open it at the same time? Bradley suggested. Sean smiled sheepishly before nodding and at the same time untied the bow that was tied up on the box. Bradley did the same thing. Everyone gasped when they saw what was inside. It was an identical necklace with a square locket hanging in the middle. There was an initial engraved on both of them. However, when they looked at it, they saw that it was precisely the same. The engraved initials were THJ. They all looked at each other confused. Grandma Becky's laughter was loud enough for everyone in the kitchen to hear. They all got curious and peeked through the sliding door. Why don't the both of you open the locket and look inside? The older woman told them, grinning from ear to ear. When Bradley opened the locket, he saw the twins' picture on one side and a picture of him and Elizabeth on the other side. He smiled so sweetly before coming forward to give his grandmother a tight embrace. Thank you, Grandma. It's the best gift ever, he whispered so his wife didn't hear it. When Sean opened his locket, he saw a family picture of Grandma Becky on the left. There was Grandma Becky, Grandpa Davidson, and his mother when she was still young. On the right side, there was a picture of him and Bradley when they were still young, before Sean had disappeared. Sean did exactly the same as Bradley. He came towards them and also knelt next to Bradley and gave the older woman a tight hug. I love you, Grandma. Thank you. Everyone clapped their hands and cheered. Bradley got up and quickly let everyone see the gift. Elizabeth was overwhelmed and tears of happiness began to spill on her beautiful face. She glanced at the older woman and mouthed, Thank you, Grandma. I love you. She then made a sign of a heart shape and put it close to her heart. The older woman only waved her hands and smiled sweetly at her granddaughter-in-law. After a while, the Moore brothers decided to go out and check out the city. Since they were not far from the mall, Logan and Nathan decided to take their three older brothers out to shop for gifts to give away when they returned to Canada. When Alice heard it, she quickly stopped her husband from tagging along and asked him to accompany her to the supermarket to shop for groceries for lunch. "'Can I go with the boys? Must I go with you to the market?' You can take one of the maids with you, you know, William pleaded with puppy eyes. Alice gave him a meaningful look before turning around to go to and get ready. There was nothing William could do but follow like a puppy with his head down. When everyone had left and the only ones left in the living room were Bradley and Elizabeth, a secret smile touched Bradley's lips. At once, he picked up his wife who squealed in surprise. Brad! Elizabeth exclaimed as she quickly wrapped both her hands around her husband's neck so she wouldn't fall. Bradley just smiled as he quickly took his wife to their room for a honeymoon without any disturbance. Episode number 366 For Better, For Worse. On a plane on the way to Las Vegas, on board were Leah and Anne to spend Christmas Day with Leah's family. Ever since Anne's grandmother passed away, leaving her orphaned, Anne had been treating Leah's family as her own. 
Leah, were you able to contact Elizabeth to apologize? I forgot that we had promised your parents that we would spend Christmas with them. Ugh. Anne's eyes were closed, trying to get a little sleep. Oh my, I forgot about it. I was so excited when you told me that we were going to be going to Vegas instead of London. I'll give her a call as soon as we land, all right? Now, try and get some shut-eye. You look worn out. Leah closed the window shade and covered her friend with a blanket before trying to get some rest herself. As soon as the plane landed and they were allowed to use electronic gadgets, Leah called Elizabeth to inform them of the situation. Elizabeth was in the children's room playing with her sons when she received the call from Leah. I'm sorry, Elizabeth, and forgot that we'd booked the flight already and we couldn't cancel it the last minute. I hope you understand. She really wanted to be there and spend time with her godson, explained Leah apologetically. Elizabeth was waving her hands in the air as she answered. No, 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 it's fine. We understand how important it is to spend time with family. To be honest, I have a full house of family right now, too. My brothers all came home from Toronto and surprised us. Hearing Elizabeth's reply, Leah let out a sigh of relief. All right, then, I'll let Anne know. Just as she was about to bid Elizabeth goodbye, Anne woke up and heard her last comment still yawning and half awake, half asleep. Is that Elizabeth? Let me speak to her. Anne quickly interjected while her hands were ready to accept the phone. Leah handed over the phone. Hi, Elizabeth. Merry Christmas. I'm sorry about not being able to make it. I was so looking forward to giving my new godson a fat kiss. She playfully said while trying to fix herself as they prepared to descend from the airplane. It's fine, I understand. Family always comes first. I would have done the same thing. Enjoy and come visit us anytime, Elizabeth assured her. Suddenly, she got an idea. Anne, how long are you guys going to be there in Vegas? She asked excitedly as she gazed at her husband. Her eyes shone brightly with her idea. Hmm, we'll be here until New Year's. And if I don't have any other work, then I'll stay for a little while and take a break. I'm out on school break, too, and classes won't start up until the end of January. What's up? She asked. Nothing. I just have an idea. All right, I'll talk to you later. Take care and Merry Christmas to you and your family. Elizabeth then quickly hung up the call to talk to her husband about her idea. She found him frowning and shaking his head. She got worried. Meanwhile, CEO Justin Rogers had decided to stay for another day in London after finding out that his wife, Anne, would be flying to visit a friend in London. He had no idea that the friends Anne had planned on visiting were none other than the Joneses. But first, he had to contact his grandfather to inform him that he would not be coming home as expected. Justin looked for his cell phone and found it on the top of the nightstand where he had left it the night before. He picked it up and was about to call his grandfather when he saw his cell phone lit up and began buzzing. When he checked who the caller was, his brows knitted. It was old Will, his grandfather's assistant. What do I owe this pleasure of receiving a call from you? He said to the person on the other line, trying to scare him off, which didn't work. Old Will helped his grandfather raise him. Therefore, he knew Justin's every move. Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt your business trip, but you need to come back. Your grandfather is very ill, Will said in a raspy voice. Sadness could be heard in the way he spoke. What? What happened to Grandpa? I'll be leaving right now and should be there within 24 hours. Keep me updated and Uncle Will, please... Take care of the old man for me. He then quickly hung up and called for Ronald to make preparations. An hour later, I'm sorry, Brad, there's an emergency and I need to return home. Give my regards to your family. Justin contacted Bradley as soon as he boarded his private plane. He couldn't think straight and didn't get the chance to call him on the way to the airport. Once they were on the plane, he felt calm and remembered to call his best friend to excuse himself. It's fine, man. Don't worry. It's no big deal. There will be plenty of chances. Take care and don't worry about Chairman Rogers. He'll get better. Keep me updated and if you need anything at all, let me know. Have a safe trip. 
Bradley then hung up. He was still shaking his head with a frown plastered on his face when Elizabeth found him. Sweetheart, what's wrong? Are you all right? She asked as she sat down next to him, voice full of concern. Bradley shook his head and looked at his wife adoringly. I'm fine, sweetie. It was Justin. I just spoke with him. He's needed back home, so he won't be able to come over. Ah, she said while her head was bobbing up and down. Elizabeth informed Bradley of her conversation with Anne and excitedly told him her plan. Bradley loved the idea, and they agreed to do just that. When everyone came home, Elizabeth happily informed her family what they planned to do. And once they heard her idea, they all jumped and began preparations. After lunch, everyone hurried up and packed their belongings and were on board the THJ private plane on their way to Las Vegas. THJ's private plane was in full capacity when it landed at McCarran International Airport four hours later. Everyone was having fun the whole way that they didn't realize that they arrived already until the captain announced to buckle their seatbelts. A couple of minutes later, they landed, and everyone excitedly began preparing to embark. William helped Alice unhook her seatbelt. Let me do that for you. After unhooking his own, Elizabeth's older brothers seated at the back all got up one by one and began gathering their belongings. Excitement was visible on their handsome faces. Gosh, I'm so excited. I can't believe that we're going to be spending New Year's here in Las Vegas. Logan exclaimed loud enough for everyone to hear. Nathan hung his arms on Logan's shoulder and whispered, We need to check out the strip clubs. Shh, replied Logan with his fingers on his lips. Bradley and Elizabeth were already standing by the door and ready to disembark on the tarmac. They were followed by Sarah and June, who were carrying each of the twins. Soon, with Elizabeth and Bradley leading them one by one, they all descended to the tarmac. There were a couple of limousines waiting to take them to the resort where they would be staying. They spent a whole week in Las Vegas watching shows, gambling, and partying. Anne and Leah joined them for the fun the entire time. After the New Year's celebration, the duo bid the Joneses and Moores goodbye with the promise to keep in touch. The holiday was over, and it was now time for Bradley to start the treatments. He needed to go back to Madrid, and they decided to take the twins and their caretakers with them this time. Sarah, June, and Tiny were to accompany the Joneses. Thomas, Liam, and Jacob all went to their jobs. Nathan and Logan also started internships and moved out of the house to live closer to their jobs. Grandma Becky and Hannah went back to New York with Sean, while William and Alice went on a month-long cruise to Europe, courtesy of Bradley and Elizabeth. One year later, Elizabeth stood in front of the full-length mirror, admiring herself. Cedric was running around her busy, making sure that all was in place. Oh my god, you're so beautiful! Cedric squealed in excitement. He couldn't contain his happiness after seeing his creation. The wedding gown he had designed for Elizabeth was exquisite and elegant. Who would have thought that the girl wearing this magnificent dress had just given birth to a beautiful little girl three months ago? She looked like a goddess descended. Elizabeth's lips curved a little, seeing how proud her friend Cedric was of his creation. She also couldn't believe the woman in the mirror was her. Time went by so fast. In the next few minutes, she would walk down the aisle with her father to finally have a real wedding. A sweet smile was plastered on Elizabeth's beautiful face. This was it. This was real. After all the hardships, tears, and heartbreaks, after every obstacle that came their way, they had won. She and Bradley. Not too long ago, Elizabeth had set out to prove herself in the world and to earn for her family what they deserved. Little did she know that the stranger she bumped into at the airport right before departure 
would become her savior, her everything. Not long ago, she was just the billionaire's contracted wife. And now, now she was a successful businesswoman, the wife of a man who loved her more than anything, and the mother of the heirs of their empire. Now she was the billionaire's life partner. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, until parted by death. Elizabeth smiled at herself in the mirror and saw the complete happiness in her eyes. She turned to walk down the aisle.